Hi, this is Pablo Gonzalez, and I'm here to talk about clean Apex code. If you've been developing on the Salesforce space for a while, I'm sure you have seen horrible code. In fact, I'm sure you have written horrible code, just like I have in my previous years. It's not easy to learn how to code well, but here I'm gonna give you five tips that are gonna make it easier for you to think about design patterns and clean code. Let's get started. All right, so the first tip is how to use guard clauses to prevent deeply nested code. Again, if you've been on the Salesforce space for a while and developing for a while, I'm sure you've seen code that has at least five levels of nesting. If this, if that, and then four loops and a few more things. And then the real logic starts like five levels deep and you have all these preconditions and Boolean variables uh, that just creates a lot of noise before you actually see the logic that really matters for your users. And really what those uh, if conditions are doing are just trying to pre-filter some conditions, right? If this is true, if that is true, and then at the end you end up with, okay, we should execute this piece of business logic, but again, five levels deep. It's really hard to understand which logic matters. Is it the filtering logic at the top, or is it the thing that is five levels deep and buried underneath a bunch of uh, Boolean expressions. So one thing you can do is you can flip the equation. You can say, well, if none of these things are true, then just exit the function immediately. And that way you can just put the conditions one on top of the other. And if they're not true, you exit. If they are true, then the actual business logic starts right there. It's no longer nested five levels deep, it's just below those conditions and that is known as a guard clause and it just makes it so that your code can exit as soon as possible if the conditions are not met and aside from making the code easier to read it also avoids processing code that doesn't really meet the requirements or doesn't meet the conditions for that code all right this tip is about not using triggers to model multi-object business processes this is a bit of a tough one to explain, but let's say that you have a requirement that spans three different objects. So maybe something that starts on the opportunity and then goes to the account, but eventually has an update on the user who owns that account. So those are three different objects and the business process as a whole requires for those three objects to be updated. One way you could implement that business process in Apex is using triggers in each object. So you have a trigger on the opportunity, another one on the account, and another one on the user object. The problem is that that process is actually split in three completely different areas, and you're relying on the order of execution for that process to be completed in the order that your business requires. The challenge is that you cannot guarantee that the order of execution will always be the same. For example, sometimes the opportunity trigger may fire for completely unrelated reasons, or the user trigger may, may fire for conditions that are not really related to the business process that the business cares about. So this is known as spreading out a business process across different triggers. What I recommend instead is that you put all that logic in one single class where you can control the whole execution end to end. So you have one class called business process A and you have method one, two and three, one per object, and then you call the methods in order. That way, anyone who's looking at that code is going to immediately look at it and say, oh yeah, I can see this is one business process. And again, you have full control of the entire execution. That's much better than looking at three different triggers with three different entry points and trying to figure out are these related or are these you know, completely different functionalities. So again, if you find yourself having to model business logic that spans multiple objects, don't use triggers of those objects. Instead, create one class where you can encapsulate all the business requirements in one place. All right, this next tip is called modeling business logic inside out. One of the challenges that I've had as a Salesforce developer is that it's never been clear to me where should business logic go? Should business logic go on the trigger itself? Should it go on the trigger handler? Should it go on a domain class? Or should the business logic be split across those three? 
Or as I said on a previous tip, what if you have a process that spans multiple objects? Should you spread that logic across different triggers or just keep it in one place? It's never been easy for me to understand where should I put logic that relates to the business. Again, you could also put it on a service class or a domain class or something else. So what I've learned over the years is that there's two types of code that you can have. You can have infrastructure code or infrastructure logic, and then you have actual business logic. Infrastructure logic is everything related to how some business logic gets executed. Uh, for example, the trigger context variables, such as trigger that new or trigger that old. You have batch Apex, you have REST API and endpoints. And all that stuff is just architectural concerns. The business doesn't care about that. The business cares about, you know, when this happens, that should happen. That's the actual business requirement. So if you make that mental split, right, there's infrastructure logic, which relates to trigger processing, endpoints, batch apex, and then there's actual pure business logic that the business cares about. Then it's a lot easier to think, where should that go? So what I recommend is that you write business logic not thinking about um, infrastructure but about the core and so let me give an example the core could be that when an opportunity is closed a contract should be created so you could start by modeling that logic in apex without any knowledge about how that's going to be called it doesn't matter if it's going to be called from a trigger or from a batch apex class or from a lightning web component just create a logic in a way that is more or less agnostic to the infrastructure that is going to be calling that logic that makes that module a lot more reusable because eventually you could use it again in a lightning web controller or a batch apex class or a trigger then you can have another layer where you have the infrastructure that actually calls to that business logic and so that's what I mean, creating the business logic inside out is start from the core, which is the pure business requirement, and then spread out to the infrastructure logic. All right, so the next step is not to test implementation details. When we are testing in Apex, there are basically two ways we can test. We can test the specific methods that we call from a trigger, or we can just test the observable behavior. So let me give you an example. Let's say you have a trigger that when an account is inserted, it changes the phone number or it formats the phone number. There are two ways you can test that. You can test the methods directly that format the phone number, or you can just insert an account and see was the phone number formatted correctly. The first version where you test the methods directly is known as testing the implementation details. If those methods change, or if you test, if you change the method signature, or if you take that method and split it into smaller methods, then your test has to change because the test is coupled to how those methods actually work. On the second scenario, where you just insert the account and then just check was the phone number updated, you're testing the observable behavior. In that scenario, you don't really care how the phone number was updated. It could have been a flow, could have been one method, could have been three methods, could have been a different Apex class. It doesn't matter. And what's important about that is that then you can change the implementation to be anything else you want and the observable behavior is the same. And so your test will continue to execute and pass even if the implementation internally has changed. Now, unfortunately, that means that that is more or less an integration test. And in my other video with Salesforce Ben, where I gave five tips about Salesforce DevOps, we talked about some of the challenges with integration tests. So I recommend that you watch that video for more information on that. However, the core idea is that your test should ideally test the observable behavior, which is the business logic that users care about instead of the implementation details, which is the how-to and how the coordination of small methods or different classes, those details should be irrelevant to a test. All right, and the final tip is one of my favorite design patterns, which unfortunately is not popular at all and almost no one talks about it, and is known as designing errors out of existence. <laughs> 
So the idea here is that our code has a lot of exception handling, a lot of edge cases, right? If this happens, then handle it this way. If that happens, then do that. If there's an error here, catch it there. But if the error says this, then throw it back there. So a lot of the code, a lot of the business logic that people care about gets actually modded with a bunch of logic that is more about infrastructure or error handling or handling edge cases that are, again, are not too relevant to the business logic. And so this design pattern basically says that you could model the logic in a way that invalidates the edge case completely, where basically the edge case ceases to exist and so you don't have to handle it. So a good example of this is inserting an empty list in Apex. I've seen many Apex code bases where before inserting an empty list or before inserting a list with DML, uh, developers check if the list is empty, right? So if it's not empty, then they insert it. And you see a lot of code with that. And there are some legitimate reasons for doing that, especially around performance, but that code really is not business logic. And I've learned that a lot of people do that check because they are afraid that Salesforce could throw an error if you try to do an insert on a list that is empty. However, what the Salesforce Apex team did is if you insert an empty list, nothing happens. So imagine if Salesforce had said, you know what, if you insert an empty list, we're gonna throw an error. Then everyone would be forced to always check if a list is empty or not before actually inserting it. But Salesforce decided that if the list is empty, just nothing happens. And so there's no edge case to handle, there's no error condition, the code just silently does nothing. And that means that they change the semantics of the operation so that the edge case doesn't exist anymore. And that's what, it, what I mean by designing the error out of existence. If we can change our design in a way that the edge case feels as natural as the happy path, then our code will be a lot easier to write because it's not gonna be riddled with if, if, if else conditions checking for different edge cases. All right, and those are the five tips to writing clean Apex code. This is not gonna make your code base not the theme of nightmares overnight. However, it's gonna help you write cleaner code. If you want to learn more, I have two resources that you can check. The first one is my book, Clean Apex Code. And the second one is the Apex Well-Architected Framework, which is a companion site to my book. And thank you very much.